Okay. Well, let's jump right into our second general session featuring me. I'm Harry Bull. I'll be your speaker for this session. Um, this session is called Optimizing the Whole Customer Journey. And I want to kind of explain its genesis a little bit, and then I'll jump in. So, for years we talked about optimization of digital marketing. We talked about optimizing your media program, you know, search engine optimization, optimizing your email, optimizing your, your, your paid search or whatever it is, right? And now we have all these marketing balls in the air and we have to practice cross-channel optimization. Especially if you're going from media to your website to a nurture campaign, to salespeople meeting with your prospects, and you have this whole customer journey that you need to, number one, visualize, and then second, improve. And that's what this is really about. This is about optimizing the full customer journey. Actually, where's that handheld mic? So I can walk around. Um, anyway, we'll get it a little later. Okay, so let's jump right in and talk about optimizing the customer journey. Now first, just a little bit up here, Shepherd, with my water. Thank you very much, Sheppy. So, just a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, so, as some of you know, I am the CEO of Overdrive Interactive, and we're basically what you would expect from a digital marketing firm. We're a full-service integrated digital firm, providing all the major food groups of digital marketing. Digital first strategy and planning, persuasion-oriented creative that gets people to do what we want them to do, search engine marketing, account-based marketing, online media, search engine marketing, all those things you would expect to use to open and widen your digital marketing channels. Now, one thing that we have a lot of experience with being here in Massachusetts is tech B2B, right? This is what we have a lot of here. And one thing about working with tech B2B is that there are very high levels of accountability that you have to incorporate into your day-to-day -day activities because everything we do in Tech B2B, especially, is measured. We're measuring every step in the sales funnel, and we're creating, we're launching these very long customer journeys, often for some of these products that are very high consideration products, and the sales cycle can be literally months and years. So we're not just creating these one-time events that create a transaction, we're actually creating customer journeys. We're creating relationships that pull prospects into our brand embrace so that we stay connected with them and we can nurture them from being interested to being engaged. And then, of course, hopefully escalate them into customers. So the reality of digital marketing today is that, and what I want to do right now, by the way, is I'm going to do two things here just so you guys know what I'm going to do. One is I want to stop, I want to speak broadly about digital marketing and give everyone an approach to kind of get their heads around all the components and all the balls that you have to have in the air. There's no way you're ever going to learn everything and there's no way you're going to be an expert in everything there is to know in digital marketing. But what you can do is have sort of a generalized approach to it that you can apply to how you incorporate knowledge and new technologies into the way you do things every day. So this first part is going to be, how do you look at digital sort of broadly and, and sort of put it into a system that you can embrace as an individual to get to know things? And then how do you go into all of those different channels and start to do cross-channel optimization to bring about better results for your organization or for your clients? So the first thing to understand is that the lines are learning in digital marketing. You have search engine optimization, you have paid search, you have online media, you have social media, creative and website development, email marketing and automation, and of course, analytics. And all this together is integrated to digital. And let me give you some examples of how this works, okay? So let's say you're doing search engine optimization and paid search. Or let's just say you're doing paid search. Okay, great. You are driving traffic to what? Landing pages. So you have to couple great search management with persuasion-oriented or purpose-driven creative that gets people to do what you want them to do. Those clicks from Google on their own aren't doing anything. They're not making people engage, pay attention, transact, buy, become a lead, right? It's the landing page that encourages 
desired behavior. So you've got to have great SEM management, and you've got to have great creative that actually gets people to do what you want them to do. Now, let's say on a good day, you get 2% of the people hitting that landing page to do what you want them to do. That means that 98 out of 100 people that you throw into that page looking for something like, you know, two-factor authentication or something like that, some real specific technical term. You got 98 out of 100 people, you know, 98, you got 100 people hitting that page. Two of them are converting and going up into your email and marketing automation platform. What happens to the other 98 that didn't convert? Well, typically you're setting a cookie on their browser, right? And now you're following them around the web with retargeting, going on to Zappos, where you put like a pair of boots in your shopping cart, now that pair of boots follows you around. Well, that's what happens when you go online. About 80% of the ads you see are tailored to target you, either with retargeting or programming or something like that. So we've gone from paid search to quick landing pages. Some of those people have gone off to be nurtured with email and marketing automation. About 98% of those people went to some kind of cookie pool. Now you're retargeting them. Now you need great creative so they pay attention. Hopefully you get them back to your website where they finally create, uh, sorry, they finally convert, go into marketing automation, and then they, you know, you measure what works, what doesn't work. So all this stuff has to work together. And you can say that about any of these channels and the way that they relate to, the, to each other and the way that they synergize. So you really have to understand how those different channels interact and how they connect. You also now, today, have to understand the marketing stack, and every organization has a different configuration of marketing technologies. Again, you don't need to be a Salesforce administrator or a hands-on manager of a DSP or programmatic platform, but you gotta understand what this stuff does, and you have to understand where it fits in your organization. So one of the things we like to do is go into an organization and do an audit of their stack. First to say, what do they have? Now, if you would do an audit of your organization's marketing staff and you run into a piece of technology and you don't know what it does, that's your career on you. Saying, Google that or watch a quick explainer video on that technology and really understand what it does. Again, you're probably not responsible for managing it since you don't even know what it is. <laughs> but it is good for you to quickly understand what it is. And all that takes is a five-minute Google search. So remember, you know, one of the things is really get to know the ecosystem that is powering the marketing that you're doing every day. You know, you probably have some sort of paid media um, um, platform like Google Ads or some programmatic DSP. You're probably managing social media with Hootsuite or Sprout or Sprinkler. You might have Bright Edge for SEO. You definitely have Google Analytics. You probably have a Google Tag Manager. I'm sure you have Salesforce, Marketo, and Al Alcon, all that stuff. So again, get to know those platforms and get a general understanding of what those platforms do. And, and if you don't know that already, again, it's a, it's, it's a Google, it's, it's a YouTube explainer video away. So once you, oh, I'm gonna stay here with this mic. So once you have your head around the marketing stack and the different things that you can do, you can start to create renderings that help you visualize your marketing infrastructure. And this is really important. And it's funny, I've got a couple clients in the audience that have been with me for a long time, so they're gonna recognize this chart. I've literally been using it for 20 years. And the nice thing is, in marketing, even with all this change, there are some constants. That's the good news, okay? So one of the things that we try to do with our digital marketing renderings is help people figure out where they live in this whole digital ecosystem. I mean, now we have organizations where we're having to keep all these marketing balls in the air all the time. So what this chart's gonna do is it's gonna organize all those balls that you keep in the air into a sensible rendering, or like an infographic, okay? So the first thing we typically start with is your brand, right? Now, typically in digital, we are not the creators of your brand, but we need to understand it. We need to understand it from a visual standpoint, from a tonality standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, and under that brand umbrella, the first component we're typically deploying is drop. You might have SEO, SEM, digital media, social media. You might have outdoor, television, radio. Like what are all the things you're doing out there to drive traffic and push it into your website where you typically have capture? 
You've got your website, or your network of sites, you've got landing pages, webinars, trade shows, call centers, all those places where you can connect with your target audience and hopefully capture some information and put that into convert, where you're trying to escalate them into MQLs and SQLs and things like that, or marketing qualified leads. So now you capture all this information or this data and you pour it into convert. Now typically you have a few modules within convert, right? You have your database and CRM, so that can be Salesforce, Pardot, Salesforce, Marketo, HubSpot, whatever it is, and you have your sales team. Now your sales team is typically cherry picking the best leads out of those leads that you're driving. But let's face it, have you ever dumped a thousand leads on a sales team and seen what happens? Did you get a lot of praise? No. Probably not, right? Sales people do not want leads. Sales people do not want leads. They want layups. That's what they want, right? So what do we what have we started to do? We stopped dumping thousands of leads and white paper syndication leads and things like that on the salespeople. We started putting them into these databases so we could push out email, direct mail, social, and, and telemarketing communications where we can get someone to finally raise their hand and go, ah, yes, now I'm ready to talk to a sales rep. So that's what we're trying to do with all this, is we are trying to escalate people to the point where they're actually willing to talk to us. And now a salesperson will step in and talk to that person and sing the praises for that lead. They didn't have to chase them around. And then finally, everything we do is wrapped in optimized. So that's the ability to track, report, and respond to what works and what doesn't work. Now, this particular rendering we call drive, capture, convert, optimize. And 99.9% .9 of our demand gen clients plunk themselves neatly right into this construct. Now, the interesting thing about this, and the reason why we like to show it, we often start quarterly summits with our clients with these renderings, is because the people doing all this are spread out often across departments, across the country, across the world, across different companies. And this is a way that everyone can get together and be like, all right, everyone, here's where we live in this demand gen infrastructure. These are all the halls we're keeping in the air all the time. This is where, hey, a SEAL firm, you live up over here. Person managing Pardon, you live over there. Person managing the website, you live here. Analytics, you live right there. And it gives everyone a place to live in this whole infrastructure. So the first thing you gotta do, well, after you understand your MarTech stack, is render out the whole infrastructure and put initials next to who's doing what. Okay. So now we've launched this, this whole infrastructure. Let's talk about making it actually work. So we talk a lot about MarTech. We talk a lot about various forms of digital media. Well, here's a constant. Good creative gets people to do what you want them to do. Again, the, the media itself doesn't get people to do anything. It's the messaging that you layer over it. So you still need to take all this great AI and all this great technology and match it with things that people actually like, the things that people will actually respond to. Now, what we try to produce is what's called purpose-driven creative. Because usually in digital, we're trying to get people to do something, right? There's a very specific measurable behavior that you're typically trying to drive in your programs, and you're usually being judged by the success the, 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 the success of those programs are usually being judged on these metrics, right? So you want creative that encourages the desired behavior you're measuring. So you really need two things. We found that there's two important factors when you're doing digital creative that you really have to pay attention to. The first is to go with the group, the VP of marketing over at Brigham Women's Hospital. Her name is Vicki Malfatano, told me this. She said, she said, creative's gotta go with the groove. And I was like, what do you mean by that, Vicky? Like, it has to be groovy? <laughs> and she said, no. In everyone's mind, there's a groove. And that groove is based on what they know, what they need, what feels familiar to them, what stories they already know. Now, in digital, you don't have time to tell a long story. You need to figure out that little piece of information that's going to synaptically click or melt in people's minds right away and connect to 
to a larger story. That larger story is usually related to what they need. So that's the key thing. You got to you can't tell that whole story. You got to tell a little story that hooks them either intellectually or emotionally so that they pay attention. And you know what? You don't have a lot of time to do that. It's going to be a really short story. Now, one thing I'll add is we love search marketing using search. They've already told us what they're looking for. So we have a lot of those questions answered. Now, secondly, you have to encourage action. This is not a billboard. This is a direct response vehicle. People can click, people can fill out forms, they can click to call. You are trying to encourage specific, measurable actions. So your creative doesn't just have to look good, it actually has to get people to do something. So you really want to focus in on your creative on what you want people to do. So I want to give you a little trick that's really helped me in my career. You want to look at every single piece of creative you produce. I don't care if it's a tweet, a website call to action, a web page, an email, a banner, whatever it is. You got to look at that piece of creative and say, what do I want people to do right now? Not tomorrow, not in a week, literally, right now, what do I want them to do when they're looking at this? Okay, and you can't say these are the five things I want people to do. What is the one thing? One thing is hard, two, really hard, three, forget about it, impossible. So you gotta think about what is that one thing that I want people to do, right? So you gotta sell the action and the product. So many times I go to landing pages and web pages where they're just talking about all the features and all this stuff, and all they want you to do is fill out a form, right? So when you, when you direct someone to a landing page, what are you, especially if it's a multi-million dollar tech B2B product that takes two years to buy? No one is buying that from a landing page. So what are you really selling? What are we really selling? We're selling conversations. We are selling a conversation with the sales rep, typically. That is a much easier sale than selling some multi-million dollar tech solution from a landing page, right? Selling conversations and promoting the value of that conversation is much easier. So, you want to look at each piece of creative and say, what do I want people to do right now? If you want them to fill out a form and become a lead, then you have to tell them the value, the three reasons why they should fill out this form right now. What are they going to get? What are they going to learn? How is their job made easier? How are they going to be more successful? So, Sell the action, whether it's filling out a form, opting in, engaging, sharing, joining, connecting, downloading, going to retail, buying, sorry, whatever it is that you want them to do. You've got to look at that one piece of creative and say, what do I want people to do? And if you've got three things going on, or the thing you want people to do is at the bottom of the landing page, or it's obfuscated, or it's buried, or too clever, they're probably not going to do it. If the thing that you want them to do is front and center, and all the copy and imagery on the page is directed at getting them to do that thing, chances are you will get more people to do it. So what's happening today? Why are we all at conferences like this? Because we are all marketing professionals. And we have to become marketing engineers. Now I'm not saying that you all have to become developers or programmers, but you have to be competent and conversant in speaking with programmers and digital designers and digital media people to make sure they're doing the things that you need them to do and that you understand what they're talking about. So I'm going to turn you on marketing engineers right now. Okay? Ready? So the trick <coughs> to becoming a marketing engineer is to always ask this one question all the time, every day. Just in my career, I never stop asking this question. You ready? And then what? Let's do it together. You ready? And then what? Come on. And then what? Again. And then what? One more time. And then what? Right? I mean, think about this. How many, if you, if you think about these B2B customer relationships, or any high value consideration product, 
you have to ask yourself, what is the next step in escalating a prospect through the sales process? And if you have 25 touch points in that process, which is not unusual between you know, banner ads and phone calls and emails and all the things that you do to touch customers, 25 touch points is not unheard of over a two year sales process. In fact, that's probably a low number. So as marketers, as the conductor of this, you always have to be saying, and then what, and then what? I mean, it's like, I work for organizations where we generate all these leads, and we'll say, they'll say, oh, those, those leads aren't that good. And, and we'll say, well, you know, what's happening with the leads? Where do they go? I don't know. All they know is the salespeople don't like them. See, that person's not asking, and then what? They don't know where their leads go, they don't know what's happening with them, they don't know how they're being nurtured, they don't know when they're being contacted. So if you want to be successful in marketing, you've got to follow the customer journey and the data journey all the way to the end. And the end of the data journey is the report. So to do that, you have to go, and then what, and then what, okay. You know, so, so let's do and then what, right? Let me do an and then what stream of consciousness. This is what you have to be able to do as a marketer. And, and if you just ask and then what all the time. Now obviously you didn't all just become marketing engineers, but I gave you the tools to do it. If you ask and then what, and then what, and then what, then what's gonna happen, then what's gonna happen. And you eventually run into some technology or platform you haven't heard of, right? If your career calling you, you Google it and eventually you will ask and then want so much that you will understand every step in this process. So here's a quick and then want stream of consciousness, okay? User sees a digital ad, and I know this is rather parochial, actually, but I want to say this. This is what we're doing in digital. We are engineering the obvious. Don't be clever. Engineer the obvious. Okay, number one. Number two, we are taking these things that take two seconds or a millisecond and we're elongating it. We're really thinking about it. So here is a stream of consciousness. User sees a digital ad with content and offer and clicks. Great, and then what? Okay, user arrives on the targeted landing page with a form and offer. Okay, now you need to have some technical knowledge, right? System sets a bunch of cookies, right? As soon as we get that person to our site, we're setting a double click cookie, we're setting a Google Analytics cookie, we might be setting a very <coughs> targeting cookies and things like that, we might be setting up a Pardot or a pedo cookie. So you gotta know, like when we first connect with someone online, what is that thing that happens? What are those cookies being set? Okay, so now the user fills out a data form, okay? and becomes a lead. Yay, we got a lead, okay? This is where people's brains used to stop. They were just like, I got the lead, and that was it. Well, guess what? There's a lot more to it, right? That's not the end of the process. That's actually the beginning of the process. So what should happen? Well, how about the system kicking out a personalized auto-reply email, right? Now, how about this? You ever fill out a form and then it just has this blank screen that says, thank you, we'll get back to you shortly. Do you know what that's saying to people who just came to your site and filled out a landing page from Google? That's saying, thank you, you can go now. Why don't you go back to Google, click on our competitor, and fill out their form too? No, that's not what you want to do. You want to present them with more stuff to do on the thank you page. Hey, here's your white paper, or we'll get back to you in one business day. And by or, in my case, I think it should be, we'll get back to you in five minutes. But then here's more stuff to do. Here's relevant product links. Here's a video you can watch. Here's, you know, links to our social sites. But keep, here's what people are saying about us, or the product that you're interested in. So keep people engaged. Don't just give them this blank screen and tell them they can go. Keep them engaged. Okay, so we keep them engaged. Now, what happens? Now we start talking about the data journey. Where does the data go? Right, so the data is sent into Marketo and Salesforce, marketing automation. Leads are tracked and reported on so we can optimize. And then future promotions, programs are planned against that database that we created in terms of nurture campaigns and PDR is reaching out to them, direct mail, things like that. So in reality, any of us can go on and on and on and on with a whole long list, but that's what you have to do now. You're trying to visualize 
a customer journey and a customer relationship. So that's what this and then what and then what and then what does. It helps you construct that entire customer journey. Now, when we talk about digital marketing, especially B2B digital marketing, typically this is what we see. It's like a blob of stuff, right? We've got you know, PDF assets and social ads and paid search ads and Google Analytics and Google AdWords and Salesforce and dashboards and Marketo and just all this stuff. And it's like this big blob. You should never look at digital in this way. This is why people get overwhelmed. They're like, look at all this stuff. I mean, your average end-to-end -end customer journey and digital campaign can literally have thousands of pieces in terms of assets and technologies and things. It, it's really overwhelming. But if you apply that and then what methodology to this, everything makes sense, okay? So now let's jump into the more, so, so what I try to do is give you sort of a, an approach, a way of looking at digital. I wanna jump in and get much more tactical now, okay? So the first thing is, as a marketing engineer, you want to lay out the whole customer and data journey, not just to work on your little slice of it, okay? So what, you can do is start to lay out you know, your ads that lead, lead to landing pages. You, know, you can see here, here, let me talk to it a little slower. Here. So you have AdWords and all these different ads, and they're promoting this. This is an infographic we have called the Regen Metrics Timeline. Someone goes and fills it out. Here they downloaded the asset. It goes into Marketo and uh, Salesforce with all the customer history, and then an auto-reply email is sent from the sales rep. And then the sales, we also trigger an immediate nurture campaign. And then the salesperson finally gets the meeting and they close the deal. And the whole thing is tabulated into a nice dashboard. See, that's a customer journey. Now, a couple very magical things happen when you lay out all your stuff in this format. Number one, how everything integrates how everything connects together, the holy grail that everyone's looking for, is instantly revealed. Instantly revealed. Here it is. This is how it fits together. Now the reality is the customer doesn't necessarily follow that journey. They might skip around and traverse it. But what you have to do is lay it out as if they were walking down the whole journey. And you have to make sure it's all working. Now let me tell you a secret. We go into these companies and we audit these journeys. Really huge enterprises. Some of these journeys have been around for years, and the people that created them aren't even there anymore. They don't even know what they're sending out in their nurture campaigns. They really don't, and here's the secret. The bigger the organization, the worse it is. I mean, I cannot tell you, we go in and we start like analyzing these customer journeys, and we just find all this stuff all over the place. So now, remember what I was talking about search engine optimization, or media optimization. This is cross-channel optimization. Can you imagine the lift in ROI if you go through some sort of you know, customer journey like this that could have hundreds of pieces in it between emails and landing pages and banners and text ads and different media programs? Can you imagine if you just pull a few of the levers in here, what that's gonna do to the cumulative effect of your ROI? So in digital now, we have so many balls in the air, we have so many components in these customer journeys, that there's no one silver bullet. The silver bullet is to lay it all out like this, and then go and find those explanation points, and fix them. And listen, I would like to tell you that Overdrive is the most brilliant digital marketing firm on the planet. Now I think it is, but here's the reality. I'm gonna to confess to you that half our success is just fixing what's broken. I mean, there might be a problem with your reporting. We come in and connect some API, and suddenly, you're doing great. Well, guess what, you were doing great before, you just didn't know. You thought, you know, you didn't attribute the ROI to the right channel. So, the first thing is fix the mistakes. Now, what I used to do at this point is kind of go down and break down all these components and show little examples of them, but I don't, I'm not going to do that. I have a, little, a new show here, okay? Because people always ask the same questions. Harry, they say, we've seen all that. I know what a banner looks like. 
I know what an email looks like. I want to know more about those explanation points. I want to know about the kinds of things you're finding that degrade the performance of these customer journeys. So that's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some of these explanation points, okay? And these are things we find all the time, like without fail, okay? So the first thing is when we're talking about cross-platform or cross-channel optimization, okay, there are three layers that you want to optimize. And I really, you know, I come from the media side of the ship, okay, so I, I'm really a media person, but I've had to really pay attention to what people are doing with the leads that they that they generate through our programs because they're not going to keep spending money on media if those leads don't close. So there are three layers to cross-platform optimization that you want to pay attention to. The first is media. Now, the reason why we pay attention to media first is because usually, I mean, we have clients who are literally spending tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So they're really burning through media very quickly. So you want to get this stuff fixed because that's where a lot of waste lives and a lot of potential to increase ROI. So you want to look at things like, are you reaching the right people at the right time? Are you covering the right content? Are you targeting the right devices? Things like that. The next layer is the technical layer. Okay, are your APIs connected? Is your tracking working? Are your pages rendering? Properly, is your MarTech stack talking? Um, you know, are your components talking amongst themselves? Okay, if the technology is broken, you can expect a degradation in performance. And then the final layer is the persuasion layer. Are we connecting people with the right pages on our site? Are we presenting them with compelling offers? Are our emails and various communications adhering to best practices? So these are the three layers we like to look at. Media, technical, and persuasion. So what I want to do is bring a few of these things to light for you and just run through very quickly what we might find on a typical customer audit or, or customer journey audit when we go through and look at all those components. And I'm going to start with media, okay? And I'll go right from the start of the customer journey right to the end. It's going to be a little bit of a fire hose of information, so get ready for the fire hose, okay? Now right, here we go. So here's some, so just pretend I'm looking at this customer journey and I'm finding those explanation points, okay? First, tons of keyword rates. Obvious, right? You'd figure in SCM, we don't have been on keywords that don't convert anything. This happens all the time. I would go into companies. So for example, first thing, dump your losers. Okay? Real data, we'll go in, we'll look at keywords, we'll say, look, for like in this example, in the last 36 months, Clients spent over half a million dollars on over 500 terms that got zero conversions in that entire time. Meanwhile, they have low impression share. So these terms are gobbling up budget that would allow them to appear under performing terms, but they're not there half the time because they're gobbling up their budget with terms that don't work. If you run a term, you spend thousands of dollars on a term and it never converts, there's not a lot of risk in pausing that term until you figure out a better landing page or something like that. So first, dump your losers. Second, low or incomplete impression share amongst your high performing terms. Probably because you got all these losers, all these bad keywords that you've been bidding on for the last three years. So let me explain what impression share is. Let's say that, that Google tells you under a certain keyword you can spend $1,000 a day, but you only have $500. Technically, you're going to be there about half the time. That's impression share. So if your budget's a million a month, and you could spend three million, you're going to be in around 33%. It's not exactly like that, but you guys get the idea. So the first thing is to look at your impression share, look at your performing, historically performing terms, and say, what is my impression share? And if it's not 98%, then you're not putting your money in the right place. So the first thing is, Figure out your performing terms and get your impression share up to 100%, or as close to 100% as possible, you never get to 100%. So low impression share among performing terms, big, big explanation point. Second, 
They're not taking advantage of Google features that they should. Now, I want to run through a few of those. The first is goal-based auto-bidding. So Google has these things called bidding strategies. They're using AI to help you optimize your account. If you have all your campaigns set on manual CPC, it means that you have to manually go in and adjust your bids every day. You can set Google to say, I want a $40 lead, and it's going to go and optimize for you. Right? So you want to take advantage, you want to know, make sure your agency and your people know about the various family strategies. Do they work all the time? No. Have we had experiences where we did a little better sort of manually manipulate, manipulating it? Yes, but it's getting better and better all the time. And it's something, about eight times out of 10 now, it will improve your campaigns. Um, no geo or location management. You just have some product or whatever, and you're just bidding all over the country. If you can't afford to advertise to the whole country, you should have a geo strategy. Like for us, I mean, my close rate in Boston is much higher than my close rate in California. So why would I even waste money advertising in California? It's just not worth it for me. So you really want to have a geo strategy, especially if you have retail locations or things like that. Now you would think, oh, well, that only applies to retail locations, or you know, the fact that you only want to do business in a certain region. That's not true. Here's an example of some research we get from Distillery for open source developers. We can see the hot spots for open source developers. So if I can spend a million a month on some category and I only have twenty thousand dollars, you may want to think about focusing your energy and your budget in those places where your audience actually lives and clusters. So it's not just about proximity to a retail location or something like that. Here's another media one. No, and this applies both to media and to AdWords. There are all kinds of demographic and firmographic filters you can layer over keywords. So again, why wait, you know, why not use these targeting abilities to tighten up the accuracy of your campaigns? No utilized, um, no or underutilized ad extensions, and no click to call. So in Google, you have your, of course, your regular kind of Google like Google text ad that we're all familiar with, right? But then you can start adding all these extensions, call extensions, site links. So if someone's doing a brand search or something like that, and you don't really know exactly what they want, you can put all of these other site links under your ad and send them to various much more relevant landing pages. <coughs> Now, in many cases, you might be taking advantage of a lot of Google's advanced advertising features. If you look at the new round or the most recent round of LinkedIn ads, Facebook ads, and Google ads, what you will find is that their entire transactional experience is built right into the search results. So this is an example of um, a catalog display, right, in the search listing with a movie. And here's an example of a scrollable catalog. And you can fill out the form right in the app. So these are called Google Gallery ads. But now Facebook, Google, um, Instagram, they have LinkedIn, they have this myriad of rich media ads. And I say rich media, it's, I'm using it loosely, but the reason why I'm using the term rich media is because they put the transactional capability or the transactional features right in the ad. So now you don't even have to have, even have, to have people click. They can just fill out the lead gen form right in the ad. So, really start to look at the advanced features of all the ads that you're working on. Now, moving down, okay, we've dialed in the media. What some things that what are some of the things that people constantly do, right? They don't track their calls. So they might have click to call or they might have 800 numbers on their landing page, but then they don't track the calls. We've had clients who thought their media campaigns weren't working until they started tracking phone calls and they realized my goodness Every form complete we get, we get a phone call, and we like those phone calls. You turn off paid search, the phone calls disappear. So we have a lot of clients now where we've reactivated their call centers. We're able to really blow up their call centers with click to call, and now their salespeople don't have to chase people around. We can generate phone calls and connect them right with their target consumers. Now, here's another mistake. Let's say you're doing call tracking and you click to call, but you have a 24-hour click-to-call program in the 95 call center. So again, you want to use some automated features so that you can turn, it off, turn your ads on and off, <coughs> turn your click-to-call on and off, and things like that. Don't, you know, if you don't have anyone there to answer the phone and the primary option is click-to-call, 
That's not a good combination. Either pause your to call, pause your whole campaign. Okay, so obviously I focused on Google AdWords a lot, but let's go out into media and retargeting, right? So we see a lot that people aren't retargeting. So you paid, you know, you know, we have clients who do like managed hosting, $64 a click. So you just spent $64 to get someone to your website, and now you're just gonna let them go, you're gonna set a cookie on their browser and stay with them. You may not be able to advertise or, or use display advertising to reach the whole world. But you can certainly afford to have a display program running against those people who came to your site looking for what you sell yesterday. That is someone you cannot afford to just let drift away, especially after you just spent $64 on a clip. Does anyone know what the most expensive click on Google is? Anyone? Mesothelioma, $840 a click. Okay, so, so, and that's because of that, that fund, right? If, if you have mesothelioma, you can get an immediate $2 million settlement from the asbestos fund. Okay, so people basically aren't doing retargeting, right? We all know how that works. You come, you get a page, we set a cookie on your browser, and now we follow you around with our ads, right? Now, I would submit to you that retargeting is as effective as email, right? We're all greedy for email, we send it out, but we also know that most of our email is not getting read, it's getting blocked, it's ending up in spam filters, it's ending up in the clutter folder, the promotional folder, all that stuff. So I want you all to be greedy for big cookie pools, because those big <coughs> cookie pools are your unique audience. So when you build up that cookie pool, you should be looking at, at that like an email list. That's a unique audience that you just built up. You've got people who are interested in what you sell, you've got them to your site. You cannot afford to let them drift. You have to say, and then what? How do I stay in touch with those people? And the way you do it is with retargeting. So build up that cookie pool. So big mistake, little or no retargeting. Now here's another big mistake. They have retargeting, but they're not segmenting. So you just have one massive cookie pool, okay? So another thing is to segment your cookie pools, okay? So maybe there's general people, you don't know what they're interested in, but if they searched on a certain keyword and they landed on a certain landing page around a certain set of products like mobile e-commerce, you wanna put them down into the mobile e-commerce bucket. Segment your cookie pools, another big mistake. The, you know, there are AdWords programs that were set up a long time ago, those people are gone people are in and they don't know to segment their cookie pools so they don't get segmented now let's say you have segmented cookie pools what's the next mistake people make they just show them the same ad that they didn't on before that's not what you want to do okay what you want to do use retargeting the same way you use a nurture campaign so take that 12 email nurture campaign you have and turn it into display nurture. You get it? Just take, build up that cookie pool, take all of those assets and guides and thought leadership materials, and now do a display-based nurture campaign. Externalize your brilliance. Take all of that stuff that you have locked behind the gate, that form, guarding your resource center and brilliance to the world, or at least your site and expressed interest. So it's not retargeting, it's nurture or display, what did I say here? Nurture with retargeting, right? Okay, so. A lot of marketing. This happens all the time. People are really hopped up on mobile and they don't even know why. Okay? Now, mobile is great if you're selling movie tickets or a whole variety of. If you're trying to get people to do like trial downloads of software, no, mobile's not the for that and you probably shouldn't be wasting your money on mobile targeting. You should have a different offer for mobile phones. So here's an example where you have a client, they're spending 36% of their budget on mobile, but it's only getting 11% of their conversions. And they have a low impression share. So guess what? Saturate the desktop first, right? 
if, if it was me running this campaign, what I would be doing is taking all the money and putting it into desktop first. Am I missing the mobile audience? Yes, but they don't convert as well. Then take the rest of the money and target mobile with an offer that does not require a software download. Right? Maybe give them a different offer. Maybe send them a link to download. Maybe have them request the link to get the trial download if you want them to fill out the form. But people aren't downloading trial downloads to their form, to the, to the phone. Really pay attention to the difference in conversion rates. If mobile has a higher conversion rate, then it's the other way around, right? You wanna like my, you wanna saturate mobile. So misaligned device targeting, both with the media and with the offers, is a very common problem. Okay, so now they've come to your landing page and now you have a super slow site. This is also very bad. If you have a, so, a slow site, definitely use fast landing pages, even consider AMP pages if mobile is important. But a slow site is the conversion killer. It's also really bad for SEO. Now here's a big one. This is what we see all the time. There's one thing that we do that just increases the performance of campaigns. Every time it's great landing pages, right? So companies, even to this day, ignore that they have ads that just click right to native site pages, either their home page or some internal site page. They're just too lazy to create landing pages. Meanwhile, they're spending thousands of dollars on media. There are 14 things to click on this page above the fold. Remember my question? What do you want people to do? Can you answer that? I mean, okay, you want us to contact us, but really, is that really what you want us to do? Contact who? So, I'm not sure what this page is selling or trying to sell, but no one looked at this and said, what do I want people to do right now? And again, to overemphasize this, or I shouldn't, or, or not to overemphasize this, the battle is won on the landing page, okay? This is a, this, I'm gonna show you this little case study just to illustrate the power of a good landing page. So he, this is a real client. I covered up the logo to protect the innocent. Um, but you can see, here's, here's the first landing page. It's offering a 15 minute guide and content to enterprise content management. Three fields, you know, very blank, kind of minimalistic page. It was done by their IT department. I love when IT does creative. It always works out so well. So we said to them, let us test a landing page here, right? We'll use your templates, we'll put a picture of the, the, the white paper that you get to make it you know, real, to make it physical. We'll use an action arrow to point out what we want you to do. And we'll give you some bullets about the value of this guide and what you're going to learn. Now, look what happens to this conversion rate. It went same keywords, same media, same budget. It went from a 1% conversion rate to a 14% conversion rate. Those sales reps were sitting behind Salesforce and they were like, this is a one day switch. And they were like, what just happened? Because they went from getting like barely any leads to tons of leads. So the landing page really matters. One thing you can do right now is audit your landing pages. If you're looking at those pages and asking yourself, I don't know, what do I want people to do? It's not really reflected. Here's an immediate improvement opportunity. Now, I'm not saying you take everyone from 1% to 14%. That's a ridiculous example. But if you take people from 1% to 2%, you just double the performance of their campaign. The other thing you do is you turn non-performing keywords and media into performing keywords and media. All right, let's keep going. So, you know, this is an example of a good landing page with a singular focus, clearly describing what you're going to get. The other thing is you want to break your landing pages down into these different modules so you can do A-B testing. So that's the other thing. No A-B testing. Take your most popular landing pages, the ones that get the most traffic, and start testing. Because that is the fastest way to improve your campaign. Put your keywords and your media is all dialed in. You don't even get so far fiddling around with that. You've got to get, you know, the real, the rubber into the road when you try to get people to do what you want them to do. 
All right, so now we, we've run the media, we've got the landing pages, and now we've got them to fill out forms, and now we're concerned about lead quality. 2016, the top concern was lead quality, and that continues to this day. So people stopped focusing on quantity, and they start, started to focus on quality. And that's why you have to ask, well, what are you doing with the leads I'm giving you? If they're so low quality, like why are they low quality? What's, I mean, are you just calling them once and then saying they're no good? Are you just blasting them emails and, and not getting any reply? So now we have to start looking at what we're doing to nurture these prospects, okay? So the first is, so, so here's again, some very quick hitting explanation points that we find in the customer journey. So no auto reply or triggered email. So they'll come in, they'll fill out a form, hey, we'll get back to you soon, why don't you go click on our competitor's website? No auto reply email. You want to send out some sort of auto reply right then saying we got, you know, we received your information, here you go, by the way, here's my phone number, and this is who's gonna be calling you. Second, no nurture campaign. You're running this multi-million dollar or, or thousand dollar, you know, some expensive PPC campaign, and it's not even connected to a nurture campaign. You haven't even thought about the nurture campaign that you're gonna be pouring people into if they don't convert right away. Now, let's say you do have a nurture campaign. It might be chock full of really bad emails that someone launched five years ago. Sometimes they're not responsive, they could be, you know, visual overload, non-responsive, um, wrong timing, often they look like that. How many times have you seen that? How many, how many times did you click on that? Oh, I'm so desperate to read this email, I'm gonna click on, I'm having trouble viewing this email. You do not want your emails to look like that. So, a very quick audit, go to your Pardot or Marketo administrator and say, can I see that nurture campaign? Can I get all of those emails laid out in one customer journey so I can see what we're sending out? If that thing was set up five years ago, be prepared to do those emails over again because they're probably full of obsolete data and, and, and discontinued products and things like that. We see it all the time. Okay, um, moving down the, the journey, <laughs> low engagement thank you pages and slow response time. So again, there's that blank screen. Thank you, you can go now. Oh, and we'll get back to you soon. You're so important that we're gonna get back to you soon. For these people, at least they gave me a couple case studies to look at, but I'm so important that they're gonna get back to me within two days. I'm a prospect. Two days, really? I mean, you just spent $500 on a lead and now you're gonna sit on that for two days? Speed matters. One of the biggest lead quality killers of all of our clients is the amount of time it takes for them to respond to the leads. This was a study done by Kellogg um, and MIT. It's called the Golden Window. Calling within five minutes is 21 times more effective than calling after 30 minutes. I saw a stat that said lead quality degrades 80% after 30 minutes. So, call your leads. Well, one, answer the phone. Second, call your leads. Secret shop your clients. Secret shop your sales department. Fill out a lead gen form and find out to see how long it takes them to get back to you. If it's more than five minutes, you're missing a great opportunity. What do these BDRs do all day if they don't pick up the phone and call your leads? So, speed matters. And it's because people are there researching your stuff. They're probably still on your website. The other thing is, when someone calls you right away, what is the perception you have of the organization? Responsive or unresponsive? Responsive. So, speed matters. This is a bit, I know it's not like a digital marketing thing, but it isn't, and then what thing? It is what's happening with my leads. How are they being treated? Now, let's get into the data journey, okay? So here's a big thing that we see all the time. Your AdWords and your Google Analytics are not linked. Simple thing, but the amount of insights you yield, the amount of behavioral data you can leverage from your cookie pools is much greater if you link these two systems. It's very easy to do. Now, let's say you did link them, but you have a poorly configured and maintained Google Analytics. How many people here are 
positive that their Google Analytics is dialed in as it should be? No one, right? <laughs> so it's really important to do a quarterly Google Analytics audit and make sure that everything's dialed in, your filters are put in, your dashboards are set up, stuff like that. Another thing in the stack that we see wrong and you should be asking about is substandard tag management. You probably have something called Tilio or Google Tag Manager on your site, and if it is not properly configured, it just messes up a whole bunch of stuff. If it's not on all your pages, you're not tracking everything, a lot of things go wrong when your tags aren't managed properly. I don't want to get too technical, but another question you want to ask is, is our tag manager up and running and being managed properly? Along those lines, we find, now I can't even list all the problems here, but broken API connections, another real um, problem that degrades performance because now your systems aren't talking and your tracking data isn't make, you know, getting to where it needs to go. So another thing is making sure that all your API connections are connected as they should be and that your data is going all the way down into your reports. Something we often see within these API connections are misaligned data fields. Everyone's experienced this. The web form doesn't match what's in Marketo, and that doesn't match what's in Salesforce. You gotta get all that stuff aligned, because then you start losing data, and you spend a lot of cycles trying to figure out where it went and what can get aligned. So misaligned fields, another big problem that we find in the stack. All right, I'm getting the hook. Um, okay, a couple more things and then we're done. No first click lead attribution. This is another big problem, that people don't label their leads with the first click and where it came from, so you don't know where your leads came from. You have the last click, but that's not what you really need. What you really need is the first click. And the problem is, number one, people don't always capture it, and number two, they often overwrite it. So how many people have experienced that problem where you got a lead from Google, but then you sent an email, they clicked on the email, and now the lead attribution label says the email because it got overwritten. So you need to be able to have first click and last click attribution. And I'm not gonna think there's a bunch of ways to do it, but what you wanna say, the question you wanna ask is, are we doing first click attribution? If the answer is no, say why? Because we can do first click and last click and assistive click, but you have to do first click attribution if you wanna know where your leads are really coming from. Another thing that people don't do is they don't use inferred data. So this is a report we did for Akamai. It shows all the companies hitting their landing pages. Not all the people that filled out forms, but all the companies that hit those pages. We got that information from visitor track. We do what's called reverse IP lookup. So I'll run your page search. Some people will fill out forms, but then I'm able to say in addition to all those leads, those 3,200 leads, these are the companies Huge companies hitting your site looking for web performance or web security or CDN networks or things like that. You show me another form of advertising that will do that. I went into Logan Airport and they had a banner running across the entirety of Terminal C. How many leads did that generate? This is sending people right to their website when they're looking for what they sell. So not only from you know, great, you got 3,200 leads, but from a branding standpoint, show me something else that will do that. And look at the marketplace intelligence we're getting. We're getting intent data. We are getting who is in market right now looking for application acceleration. And again, we get it from visitor track. So you can see here, Nationwide Insurance is checking out my media plan and buying on my site. Or here you can see it's Athena Health, and they're looking at a creative services in our portfolio. That's pretty valuable information to a sales team to know that some you don't know necessarily who, but you know that company is checking you out. And I don't know any sales team that would want to know that information. Now, you can do another thing, which is once you know Pega Systems is looking at your site, you go into Zoom Info and you download everyone with marketing in their title. And then you dump that into your ABM program. Okay, the final thing is substandard reporting. This is a big thing we improve all the time. So now we're at the end of the, the, the journey, and this is just sort of a, an Excel wireframe of a report, but you can see it's really important day one of your campaign that you figure out what you want to track. If you're figuring out what you want to track 30 days into your campaign, 
You don't even know if your tracking is working at that point. So you've got to set up your tracking day one, and you've got to test it before you launch your campaign. Otherwise, and Shay, you know this, you lose all kinds of data in your first month, and then you gotta go to the client with a report going, well, the tracking was broken over here, so we have this blank spot in the report. So one thing is, set up your reports, decide what you wanna track, and make sure it works before you launch. And you wanna have something pretty, you know, this is a pretty standard report that we do, where we'll have various channels. Like, I can go in here and say, you know, show me search for international in France for the network management division. You see, and I can filter all this stuff out. I can look at the whole campaign, or I can drill down by division, or channel, or country, or whatever I want. And then you might have different views, like an executive summary, or monthly highlights, or reverse IP lookup that you can give to the sales team, so you tell them you know, what companies are hitting your landing pages and what they're looking at that week. You can drill down by campaign, or even keyword, or ad performance. So I'm not gonna take you through this dashboard here, but I'm just saying, like, this is a big problem, that if you don't have your tracking house in order, it's very difficult to cross-channel optimization or any optimization, because you don't know what works and what doesn't work. Finally, and I'm way over here, I know. The last thing is companies don't have tracking. People, raise your hand summit in your company in the last three months? No one. No one has their people stand up and say, okay, here are the results. You're running SCM and you get a bunch of offers. Like if you get some offer landing page combination that works really well, why wouldn't you want to weave those offers organically through your site for SCM as calls to action on your site? Why wouldn't you want to use those offers and display ads? Maybe you're going to use them in your direct mail or offline advertising. So the point of these tracking summits is not to put people on the spot. They do create accountability and transparency. If someone knows they have to stand up and present their results every three months in front of their teammates, they're probably going to pay more attention to their campaigns, number one. But number two, they're going to share what worked. And that's what people should be coming to these summits with. Hey, this is what I've learned that other people can use. And you don't have to come with 50 things. Hey, this quarter, the two things I learned that I think other departments lead with have a tracking summit. Okay, that's the show. Happy marketing. I'll take questions on the side of it if anyone has questions because I'm getting the hook, right? Uh, enjoy the rest of the show.